a kid that grew up in West Texas, and one of my first memories is my grandmother taking me fishing. And I became a fisheries biologist because of that. So take your grandkids fishing. How's that? We all would love to have our ponds look about like that. You know, I wasn't very popular last summer in doing pond talks. You know, one of my colleagues said, well, no wonder all the fish had ticks. Anyway, we'd all like our ponds and tanks to look about like that, and then we'd like to go out there and catch fish about like that, wouldn't we? Well, it's not going to happen very easily. <laughs> but uh, That would have been a world record. It was caught out in California about five or six years ago. Guess what? They proved the guy foul hooked it. It was not the world record. Okay. Most of us come from farming and ranching backgrounds, or we're trying to farm and ranch now. And... Uh, and uh, so we grow things like this, like cattle and goats and horses and things like that. But I want to remind you that those things are herbivores, right? They eat plants, okay? And that's well and good. But when it comes to our fish and our ponds and tanks, and that, that term is synonymous, what are we really growing? We're really growing bobcats and coyotes. We are growing predators. We are growing carnivores. We're growing something that eats another animal. It does not eat plants. Okay? So you've got to have a little different way of thinking about what these animals eat and how then we provide that to them in our pond environment to make it a better environment for them, to give us better habitat for them and better habitat for many forms of wildlife in general and for ourselves to enjoy the recreation of it. So there's a lot of what I think are misunderstandings. Again, we live on land. We don't live in water. Why would we intuitively understand that? And so these are some of the things I'm going to talk about and hopefully debug. But I don't have much time, so I'll move on. You can read those a little bit, but let's keep moving. Here's my first reality check. Fish are cold-blooded. They're the temperature of the water they swim in. Water temperature today is probably sitting somewhere in the upper 50s. Let's just say 58 degrees. I mean, every fish out there is 58 degrees. There's not one of them that's 60, and there's not one of them that's 55. They're the temperature of that water. That makes a lot of difference. It determines their heart rate. It determines how fast they, they move their gills to get oxygen through. It determines how hungry they are, and it even determines whether they want to have sex or not. Aren't you glad you're not a fish? <laughs> anyway, because they're cold-blooded, they don't need near the energy, near the food intake that a mammal like ourselves or a bird has to have. That meal would have, the calories in that meal would have kept a 10-pound lar largemouth bass going readily for about three months. They only eat they only need to eat to grow probably 20% of what we eat. And they don't eat every day. And they particularly don't eat that much when it's cold. They have a temperature at which they really are active, or temperature range, that they really are active and they really eat well, and that's when they grow. But that's one of the big things, is that one of the misconceptions is I catch a little fish out of my tank or out of a lake or whatever, and I think it's a young fish. It may not be. It may be quite old. It all depends on how much it's had to eat. It has nothing to do with age. Okay, and so that's something you've got to kind of get in your head. Also, they don't chew their food. They don't have the kind of teeth that we have. They, their jaw can't go sideways, so they can't even do the chewing motion. So if you can't chew your food, all you can do is swallow it whole. And so it, your mouth size, in most cases, determines what you can eat. You know, I didn't see anybody try to swallow that brisket whole. Did you? Oh, okay. Eric tried. Anyway, so mouth size determines prey size. So these things are predators. Sometimes that was in that other slideshow up there a while ago. Sometimes they make mistakes. They try to swallow something whole and they don't make it. That's a basketball. That's a big old yellow cat. He thought it was food. As a predator, that's what you try to do. You try to swallow the biggest thing you can. Okay, so to me... The question in managing ponds and tanks is how do we develop that food? How do we develop that food chain that's going to feed those fish, right? And, and I, you know, it's an ecological thing, really. 
And before I start that, one thing you can't develop a good food chain is in a muddy pond. How many got muddy ponds? Okay. Muddy ponds are not unusual. I got a muddy pond too. One of mine is muddy. So clay turbidity. I'm not going to talk about it a lot, but there's different things. If you're in these sandy soils that are acidic, you may need to lime that pond. If you lime your fields, if you lime your garden or your flower beds, you probably need to add agricultural lime to your pond. And in many cases, that will clear it. If that doesn't work or if you're not in an acidic area, you might be able to use gypsum. Or in, as a last resort, you might be able to use alum. In my experience, gypsum clears about 70% of muddy ponds. Alum clears about 90% of muddy ponds, and then there's 10% of them we just can't clear, period. And that, in that case, you're just never going to have a good fish pond. If you want to know how to clear ponds, we're Aggies. We got catchy titles to our publications. This one's called Clearing Muddy Ponds. And it tells you how to go through a little, uh, a little experiment, if you will, a little uh, analysis and determine whether gypsum will work for you or whether alum will work for you, and then it'll even then figure out how many pounds of that you need per acre foot to clear that pond. So again, a muddy pond is not one that's going to be a good fish pond unless you clear it. Now having said all that, if you just rebuilt your pond or, or built a new pond or re renovated your pond, chances are from the construction it's going to be muddy for a while and then it may settle down. Well that was the only thing good about this drought. We got more ponds <laughs> renovated in most of this country than we had done in 20 or 30 years. All right. So food chain, back to food chain. We know about terrestrial food chains. You know, it starts with plants. Plants eaten by something we'd call a herbivore, and a herbivore is eating something like a carnivore. And if you use my coyote example, maybe we would grow grass. And then we'd stock rabbits. And the rabbits would eat the grass, and they'd grow, and then we'd stock coyotes, and the stock coyotes would eat the rabbits, and we've got us a coyote farm. Okay? I said that one time, one guy in the back said, I think I already got one of those. But in the aquatic world, there's some other steps to it. And one of the bigger steps, and this is true on land too, but it's more important probably in aquatics, is what we call detritus. And detritus is nothing but dead plant material. And I'm going to talk about that. Okay, so here's the thing I'm going to try to hammer into you just real quickly, is that when we see green water, you've got to quit thinking yuck. Right? Green water are plants. They're microscopic plants, but they're there by the millions or billions, and they are the equivalent of grass. Okay? So I always like to hammer this. That's clear water. What is it? A plowed field. Is there any food there? No. And yet we want to see clear water because as human beings we like to see stuff. But I think you can be honest and say, well, there's really no food there. It won't grow many animals, will it? So you've got to make that, that association. Green water is not yuck, it's food, it's grass. Okay? And so, how can we grow more grass? We can fertilize it, right? Now, what you do with your pastures if you want to put more cattle out, or your garden if you want to grow more tomatoes, right? We can fertilize ponds, and it's a way to improve the food chain. It's not the only way, and it's not necessary always, but it's a way we can do it. And what we're looking for when we fertilize a pond is high phosphorus content. It's phosphorus. You know, everybody knows what three, the three numbers on a fertilizer bag are. The first one's nitrogen, the second one's phosphorus, and the third is potash or potassium. And uh, it's, it's phosphorus that's usually missing in that aquatic equation to help us grow algae. And the reason is the phosphorus actually, once it gets to a pond, precipitates and goes into the mud and it's not up there suspended in the water where the algae can use it. Okay? So, so that's what we're usually missing uh, is phosphorus up in the water column. So we use fertilizers that are high in phosphorus, and you may be able to read that one, that's a 12.48.8, so it's 12% nitrogen, 48% phosphorus. Alright, so that's going to create our green water. Some ponds are naturally fertile and green up on their own, and that's a great situation if you got it, a lot of them do. So, you say, well that's fine and good, but I don't see my bass eating that stuff, right? No, it doesn't. But let's go on. What does eat it? There's a whole bunch of stuff out there that floats. If it floats, it's plankton. 
if it's an animal, it's zo, zooplankton. And zooplankton are these tiny little floating insects and protozoans and crustaceans, and they're our grazers. They're the equivalent of cattle and sheep and horses, just a whole lot smaller. If we put them under a microscope, there's a millimeter. What does that one look like? A shrimp, right? Looks kind of like a shrimp, and it is. It's a crustacean. It's a member of that same family. So these are our grazers. These are our equivalents. Oops, went the wrong direction. These are our equivalents of, uh, of cattle and sheep and goats. They're out there eating the grass, okay? You say, well, that's fine and good, but I don't see my bass eating these either. Nah, wrong. When you think about it, when a fish first hatches, how big is it? It's T90, right? It's not a mammal. doesn't have any milk glands to go to. It is a predator. It's looking for a small prey item big enough to see and swallow whole. So when our bass are small like this, that is their prey. Actually, about this size, they're starting to turn over to other things. But until they get that size, that is their prey. So you've got to have a certain amount of green water and a certain amount of so plankton, if your bass are even going to survive after hatching. And all your other fish are in the same boat, your sunfish and all that, catfish, everything else. So the next step, though, is detritus. Detritus is dead plant material. Those algae live and die and reproduce in a matter of days. So algae actually produce tremendous amounts of dead plant material, tremendous amounts of detritus on a daily basis, and that's going to the bottom. But in this picture, what I've done is put a leaf that I found in a pond, and you can see, and you know as well as I do, if you went out and picked up a leaf out of your pond and felt it, it would be slimy, right? Well, that slime is living. That slime is food. That slime is bacteria and protozoans and fungi that are decomposing that leaf matter. And that slime is food. The dead algae is the same thing, it's just a lot smaller in pieces. But it still functions the same way. So you say, okay, well, what eats that? Well, there's a whole myriad of things that eat that. A lot of different worms and insects and crustaceans and all that stuff are down there working the bottom of that pond and they're eating detritus. They're eating paraphyton, really is the slime, that's the name for it, it was on that slide. And one of our biggest detritivores that people might re recognize is a crawfish or crayfish or mud bug, whatever you want to call them, right? You ever see them culture those things, farm them? What do they use when they farm them? Rice? Stubble? Yeah. Everybody thinks, well, they eat the rice stubble? No, they cut it down, let paraphyton grow on it, and then they eat it. They also catch and eat a lot of these other little guys that are out there too, but... <laughs> But still, detritus is the biggest part of their diet. And many, many fish, believe it or not, detritus is a very large part of their diets. Not in bass, but in a lot of other things. And catfish is one of them. Okay, so now we're working our way up the food chain. At least we're starting to see something that a bass might eat. But that's right, you know, all those little guys, when that guy runs out of zooplankton and stuff, he starts looking for those worms and those bugs. And that's what he eats for a while until he finally gets big enough to start eating those, our sunfish. How many people are those perch? Come on. I know you call them perch. Don't give me that. I grew up out in West Texas. They were perch. <laughs> I, yeah, like I say, I grew up out in West Texas. They were perch. The trouble is I got an education that's a dangerous thing. And I learned that, yes, we have a whole group of fish that are perch, but they're long, skinny bodied. They're not panfish. And most of the ones that'd be big enough to catch and eat live in Yankee land, not to, you know, not to be little Yankees. Okay, they're winter Texans. I know that. But I like to joke that if you call it a perch, it's a skinny Yankee fish. Okay? <laughs> These are not perch. These are sunfish. These are panfish. Brim, if you want to be from further east. But anyway. That's what they mostly eat are those worms and bugs. They're wormers and buggers. Okay? And now we've got something 
that we can move up to our bigger bass, right? Okay, so what will fertilizers, what will fertility do for you? It will simply increase your fish production by four to six times. Man, that's pretty good, right? You take the average pond that's unfertilized, muddy, weedy, whatever, just unfertilized, and if you sand it or drained it and picked out every fish from the biggest one to the little bittiest ones and you weighed them all on an acre basis, a surface acre basis, you would be sitting on about 75 to 100 pounds of fish. That's how much Mother Nature will support with no strong fertility. Again, fertility can be natural. You make it, you fertilize it or have the natural fertility and you can get up to 250 to about 600 pounds per acre. That's what a natural food chain with high fertility can support. Where is that in the real world? Shallow Florida lakes. Shallow Florida lakes are one of the most productive things in the world for fish and they will support around five to 600 pounds of fish per surface acre. We can do that in private waters though if we want to if we manage it right. Uh, you cannot fertilize if you have rooted vegetation or you will just grow more rooted vegetation. I'll talk about that in a minute. And you have to be careful not to over fertilize. You can overdo it, okay? So how do you know when to fertilize, when not to fertilize and all that stuff? You build what's called a secchi disc. The, that was a, the Italian's name that invented it. That was his last name was Secchi. It's a eight inch in diameter disc. Scientifically we paint them black and white. You can just paint it white. And we stick it on a yardstick. At A&M we call this high tech. It is a measure of the density of that algae if you stick that down in the water until you can't see it anymore, right? Does that make sense? Because it measures light penetration and the algae is what's blocking the light. So it measures density of algae. Ideally, if you want to push your pond as hard as you can push it, you would fertilize until that thing disappears between 18 and 24 inches. That's green, folks. That is green, but that's the maximum food chain without getting yourself into trouble. When do you fertilize? When it's past 24 inches. Now ideally you would start fertilizing here in mid to late March. And sometimes it takes it a while to get going, but after a few weeks it should green up. And then you watch it with this thing. You go out there every week or two and you stick it down. And when it's getting there 26, 28 inches, it's time to hit a little more fertilizer. That's one of the frustrating th things about ponds is that it's not like a field that you fertilize once this year and you probably don't have to fertilize it again. That's not the way ponds are because these algae die, they take that phosphorus to the bottom and now you don't have enough phosphorus to grow the next crop. And so it's one of these things that in a wet year you might have to fertilize half a dozen times. When I worked at Auburn University in Alabama, we, record, we actually had to fertilize ponds as many as 10 and 12 times a year if we wanted to do this right. In Texas, we're drier than that, and sometimes you can get away with one or two in a dry year, but in, in wet years, you might have to fertilize half a dozen times if you wanted to do this right. Okay, what happens when we get into these drought years? It starts to concentrate these nutrients. This starts to turn to pea soup, and we get down into these 12 to 15 inch rains. We're in trouble. Goes down below 12 inches, we're gonna have an oxygen depletion and a fish kill, unless we can control that algae or aerate and I'll talk about aeration later. So secchi disc is one of those sort of things to just help you kind of see what your food chain is doing, what the base of it is, and whether you're doing a good job or not, or whether you need to do anything at all. So again, microscopic plants, green water, eaten by zooplankton, constant amount of detritus being created. One of the bigger things, though, is it doesn't allow the prey that the animal needs, the fish needs to eat, it doesn't allow it a good place to hide. Doesn't interfere with fishing, but if you get it too thick, it can cause oxygen problems. Here's one of the common misconceptions, and I don't have time to talk about a lot of these, but, you know, again, we like to see something. We think that largemouth bass is sitting here, and he sees that 
bluegill sunfish back there against the back wall. Can I use you, Paul? So he's Paul back there. And we think, oh, wow, he, he, he can go get that fish. Well, think about it. I got to swim 50 yards. He going to sit still and wait for me to get there? If I can see him, he can see me, right? Again, clear water is, is our perception. It's not the fishes. There's a large mouth bass. If I can see Paul the sunfish back there, I know I can't catch that son of a gun. I ain't going to go swimming back there. I'm going to wait and hope he gets closer. But if the water's real clear, guess what? He's probably not going to get closer. Now we cloud that water up where I can't see anything 24 inches away. But guess what? When Paul's stupid enough, or no, not stupid enough, when Paul accidentally gets within two feet of me, guess what? He's in a world of hurt. Because now I can get him and he can't swim fast enough to make any difference. See, again, we, it's a misunderstanding that we think, oh, I've got to have that clear water so they can see. No! They only need to see far enough to strike. Which in the largemouth bass is usually less than eight feet. Eh? All right, enough of that. What's wrong with rooted vegetation? Oh, several things. One is it's too slow to decompose and decomposes in the wintertime, so we get some detrital formation, but not necessarily when we need it during the growing season. Uh, but the main thing is it's just too dense. It's just too thick. It allows the prey to get in there and, and uh, avoid the predator. Think of bur that old uh, 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 children's tale of burr rabbit in a briar patch, right? Why did burr rabbit want to be thrown in a briar patch by the wolf? Because he knew then he was going to get away. Can lead to oxygen depletions, absolutely. And you show me a weedy pond that's been weedy for a few years, and I will show you those stunted fish that don't have enough to eat. It's that simple. It's the most common problem we see, fish problem. And you tell me, when a bass is facing that, how is he going to catch anything to eat? But there's the other beautiful misconception. I'm a fisherman. I'm out on one of these lakes, and I'm fishing. I see that patch of weeds. What am I going to do? I'm going to fish it, right? You bet. I run that lure by there. Poof, I get a strike. I think, boy, that fish must like those weeds. Misperception. Why is he sitting there? Because he knows there's food in there and he can't get to it. When I run that spinner bait out in front of me, he thinks, ah, something came out. He strikes. I think he needs weeds. No, the weeds are keeping him from finding what he needs to eat. All right. Here's that food chain we've developed in. Down at the bottom, we got the algae, maybe some macrophytes, which are rooted plants, hopefully not too many. We get our detritus, we get our paraphyte, and that feeds our worms and insects. That feeds our little fish, like our sunfish, and that feeds our bass. But look at the numbers. To grow a bass to be one pound, he's had to eat about 10 pounds of prey. Sure, when he was little, he ate some of these guys. But still, he's eaten 8 to 10 pounds. We just round it off to 10 to get to one pound in size. Well, they, they are the same boat. To get 10 pounds of these sunfish, they've eaten 100 pounds of these guys. And to develop 100 pounds of these guys, you've had 1,000 pounds of those. So think about it. We all want 10-pound bass in our tanks. We do. To grow to 10 pounds, that animal has had to outswim, chase down, swallow whole 100 pounds of prey within an 8 or 10-year period of its life. That's why we're just not overrun with 10-pound bass. Especially in private ponds that are relatively small. Can be done, but it takes management. What's the alternative? Feed them. Do you feed your deer? Do you feed your birds? Many of us do. Want to spend a little more money? You don't feel like fertilizing? Set up a feeder. You're not feeding the bass, but you're feeding the sunfish and you're feeding the catfish if they're out there. You're feeding the minnows if they're out there. And that's going to just be more, more reproduction of them, which is going to give your bass more to eat. It's more expensive than fertilization, but it will work if that's the way you want to go. I like the automatic feeders. Bluegill, which is what I'm interested in feeding, they're kind of like cats. They don't want one big meal a day. They want to eat a little now, a little bit later, a little bit later. So you set that thing up so it feeds four to six times a day and feeds just a little bit each time. Don't feed them once a day. Stocking. So what do we stock and why? And why do things go wrong? 
Am I standing still enough, Eric? Okay. I'm trying hard here. Here's a mistake we make. Will that work? I don't think so, right? What is that? That's a whole bunch of predators, right? And yet that's what our fish are, is predators almost totally, not totally, but almost totally. And yet that's what our, that's what our public waters are. That's what Lake Somerville is. You know, our, our uh, what, what, whatever <laughs> reservoir you want to pick. That's what's going on out there. That's why, again, some of those are great bass fisheries, but the bass are not necessarily the dominant species out there, are they? So why would we ever do something like that? Why would we put a bunch of predators in the same area to compete with each other? Doesn't make much sense if what our goal is is to have one fish as a dominant species. And so a lot of our tanks and ponds get into that situation and we need to start over. Luckily the drought's done that for us without chemicals this last year, baby. I know mine went dry. But if you ever start over, this part of your CEU training, if you ever start over, the only legal pesticide, in other words, fish toxicant in the United States registered by the Environmental Protection Agency is rotenone. Most people have heard of rotenone, right? And there's a lot of misunderstandings about rotenone. People think it takes the oxygen out of the water. It doesn't. People think it co coats their gills and they can't breathe. It doesn't. It actually passes in through their gills, into their body, into their tissue, and literally f suffocates them at the cellular level. But it's the only thing legal. The label says you're not supposed to eat them. Really, you could eat half your body weight in rotenone and it wouldn't hurt you. But again, label is a law. It says you're not supposed to eat them. Uh, the thing that most people do wrong, rotenone, if you buy it by the gallon, is going to be about $110, $20 a gallon. Pretty expensive. One gallon is about two parts per million in an acre foot of water. So then you start adding up that and that two acre pond is going to cost you about, you know, uh, $1,000, $1,200 to rotenone if you, if you get up in this upper range. So you decide what, you, what are you going to do? Laws, labels law, I'll, I'll do it at a half a part per million, right? Trouble is half a part per million to kill your bass and your sunfish but not kill those things that you probably want to kill like mudcat, right? Or carp or gar. So only thing I'm telling you about rotenone is pay attention to the label, read it carefully, because if the species you're trying to kill are things like mudcat or bullheads, whatever you want to call them, uh, carp and things like that, you're going to have to be up there at about four or five parts per million, or it's not going to work. You'll have killed your good fish, the ones that you would have liked to save but, but can't, and you will have let survive the ones that you were trying to kill in the first place. Okay, stocking. We do it, again, on a surface acre basis because sunlight drives that food chain through the plants that it grows. And we generally recommend that you need to have about a surface acre if you really want that to be a bass pond. And again, it's simply because of that food chain, how much food is available. If it's less than a surface acre, it's just never going to support many reasonably good-sized bass. And so if it's less than a surface acre, we say think about catfish. Okay? I'll talk about that. Stocking then is based on fertility. If you're not going to fertilize them, please don't think I'm saying you've got to fertilize this tank. You do not. Okay, you may not have the time or the money or the willingness. That's fine. Don't fertilize it. But if you're not going to fertilize it, you stock a whole lot less fish. Because again, fertility is going to bring up that amount of food. You can have more fish. You can grow more fish. If you're not going to fertilize it, stock less because we're going to grow less. And these are our general numbers. 100 bass per surface acre. A thousand sunfish, which can be bluegill or bluegill and red ear. We like to put some fathead minnows, not shiner minnows, fathead minnows. We can add catfish if we want them. And we cut all that just about in half if we're not going to fertilize. But here's the key. Here's the key to private waters and largemouth bass. It's the bluegill sunfish. We've done this research for 80 years. We've looked at every fish we can think of. There's some others that'll work, but none that work any better than this animal. And there's three reasons. First, oops, sorry, wrong, wrong button. First, 
we can expect to catch some five and six pound bluegill, right? No. They're relatively small fish, right? Well, again, this bass has got to chase it down and swallow it whole. Can't swallow a one pound fish or a two pound fish unless it's 12 or 15 pounds. So we need something that stays relatively small. So there's a plus. It's got a big mouth, right? No, it's got a little bitty mouth, right? It's a wormer and a bugger. Remember that slide. So is it competing with the bass? Very, very little. It's competing with them when they're relatively small, but after that, no. It's not a competitor. So there's two reasons. But the third is the biggest. This animal is a multiple spawner. She doesn't spawn once a year like a bass or like a catfish or like a crappie. She spawns three to five times a year if she's in good condition. That's our rabbit, folks. That's going to keep pumping out that 10 pounds of prey we need to grow one pound of bass. For those three reasons, we've never found a better fish to stock in private waters to grow bass than the bluegill sunfish. In fact, that's all you really have to stock if you want a good bass pond. Two species, bass and bluegill. Nobody's ever satisfied with that, but you can do it. Here's the other sunfish we like stock. It's called a red ear. It's usually more orange than red, but that's what it's called, a red ear. If you're from further east, you would call it a shell cracker, which from the standpoint of what it eats is more, you know, more uh, com a, a name that's more proper, I guess, because what they like to eat is snails and mollusks. Why do we stock that in our pond? Because we like to control snails. Snails lead to parasites in many of our fish, our bass and catfish. You ever caught a fish out of a pond or a lake and when you cleaned it you saw those grubs in its flesh? That came through a snail as an intermediate host. So if we can control snails in our ponds, we can reduce parasite loads in our other fish. So that's why we like that fish. Uh, it often spawns twice a year, so it gives us some more bass prey, forage if you will but it doesn't replace the bluegill. They get a little bigger than bluegill eventually. And uh, the weird thing about them is you sell, seldom catch them. They're out there doing their job, but you seldom will catch one. Here's the fathead minnow, very enlarged picture. A wall hanging trophy fathead minnow is about two inches, okay? They simply don't get big. So this is, this is good from the standpoint, again, feeding, especially young bass. And the fathead, as you can see here, you know, it's pretty good size head, and if you have a fat head, you're not the uh, uh, Michael uh, uh, Phelps of the swimming world, okay? If you've got a fat head, you're a slow swimmer. So that means they're very easily preyed upon by the bass and even the catfish. So we like to stock them when we're stocking new ponds. Typically, they literally get wiped out. They get eliminated that first year. That's okay. They've put those, that first year of bass off to a great jump start. And the catfish too. In a catfish pond alone, they won't get eliminated. What about catfish? The main thing to me is will you fish for them? Again, I do not want to put another competitor, another predator out there if you're not going to utilize it. Right? If you say, I don't care about any kind of catfish, well then why would you put them in there? But you say, yeah, yeah, I like to fish for catfish. Well, let's, let, let's put a few in there. It'll create us a few less pounds of bass, but there's nothing wrong with that if that's your goal. Again, if you're not going to feed or fertilize no more than 50 to the acre, here's what goes wrong. People put too many. If you're going to feed and fertilize maybe 100 to 200, but don't get carried away. Now, if it's a catfish-only pond, the same thing holds. If we're going to fertilize it, we, well, we like to add fathead and minnows. I already said that. But if we're going to fertilize it, we can go to 100 to 200 per acre. If we're not going to fertilize it, we better stay down here below 100 per acre. If we're going to feed quite a bit, we can go up to maybe 200 to 500 per acre. But we're going to have to be careful how much we feed, and we may need to add aeration to the pot. People stock too many catfish. It's that simple. When they start coming up on the bank to get feed, <laughs> you may have stocked too many. You know, the trouble is people stock too many and then start feeding them, they come, become pets, right? How many got a pet catfish pond? I know some of y'all do. 
The trouble is, they're wonderful pets like that, but eventually that's what happens to them. And you may have stocked too many. So, you know, people say, well, how many should I stock? I say, how many are you going to eat? You know, stock twice as many as you think you'll eat in a year. And that might be good. All right, moving along. Other species, we don't put them, again, mostly because they're competitors. They compete some way, either for food, for uh, spawning habitat. Some of them eat eggs. Some of them are predators that prey directly on, on young bass and that sort of thing. And there's my list. And I'm going to pick on crappie. Okay? The big thing about crappie, and everybody loves crappie. I like to fish for crappie. I love to eat crappie. I'll go to Lake Somerville. Okay? The big thing about crappie is over-reproduction. A female bass, pound for pound, will produce roughly 3,000 eggs. So a five-pound female bass, about 15,000 eggs that she will spawn. A one-pound female crappie can spawn over 100,000 eggs. Fishermen know crappie spawn before bass. So what happens? That crappie spawn comes off, all those little guys start eating the zooplankton, bass spawn a few weeks later, all those little guys spawn, hatch out and got nothing to eat. And then the crappie go along eating everything they can until they get about this size. And look at the eye. The eye looks too big, yes? That's a sign of a stunted animal. Those crappie were three years old. Three and a half inches long, three years old. You can read the newspaper through them. A lot of them out there. The trouble is, nothing for them to swallow whole anymore. Probably getting one or two bugs a year. That's enough to stay alive. It's not enough to grow. Same thing can happen to bass. So one of the things that we try to train people to do in managing these ponds is look at how to maintain balance, because that's a key. And you, and you do that through looking at catch records and seining records, but the main thing is that you look at size and condition. You know, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to match predator and prey and size and, and, and everything so that, so that there's big sunfish for this guy to eat, there's little sunfish for these guys to eat. But look at all those bass. Do they look skinny? No, that should tell you something. They don't look skinny. Bass do not go on diets. They do not suffer from anorexia. These are supreme predators. Think of them as that movie Alien. He ate everything he came to, right? A friend of mine, his fish brother, said this one time, I wish I'd have thought of it. He said, you know, it's a good thing they don't get to 200 pounds, they'd eat our children. <laughs> He's right. Little 40-pound kid jumping upon 200-pound bass, well, <laughs> it'd just be another meal. They don't care. They're eating machines. You see one that's skinny, the light bulb ought to come on. If he, especially the enlarged tail, it means he's been skinny for a long time. But the main thing is he's skinny. If you can poke him in the belly and hit his backbone, he has not eaten anything. And he's not done that out of choice. He's done that because he can't find anything. He is stunted. He's not growing. Putting him back isn't going to help him. It isn't going to help that pond. You take him out, or her, whatever. Stunted bass is the main problem, and again, it's because of our misperception that because this animal is small, that it's young. It may not be. Worst case I ever saw was a pond outside of Somerville in the early 1980s when I was in graduate school, and this guy, you could throw a a little spinner bait out there and catch an eight inch bass on every cast and we took them back and we aged them and they were eight years old. Eight inches long, eight years old. There were a bunch of them out there. But, well with a, a bass and with a lot of fish they have an ear bone. They have, like we have three ear bones, they have a single ear bone. It's called an otolith. And, and it actually lays down rings for annual growth, just like a tree. And so you can go in there and take that otolith out and put it under a microscope. If it's a big fish, you kind of have to sand it a little bit. Put it under a microscope and you can actually count the rings. And that'll determine age. Unfortunately, it's a terminal determination. <laughs> they don't live through it very well. 
Anyway. So many times what we've got to do on our ponds is set up a, some sort of slot limit. Keep records and set up a slot limit. Most slot limits are where we're taking fish out that are between usually 12 to 16 inches or 10 to 14 or 10 to 16, somewhere in there. You're taking out most of the animals that are this size. Now that bass looks pretty healthy, but again, he's not got a big old potch belly on him, does he? So he's not eating too much. And so you set that stop slot limit up. So the key is really fishing. It's to remove bass. You don't remove any the first year, but after that you remove the small skinny bass usually in this 10 to 16 inch range. And in an unfertilized pond, that's usually 25 to 40 bass per acre per year. And that's if you haven't fertilized. That's still a bunch of fishing, guys. That means you can't throw that spinner bait the size of a softball. Because they can't catch that, right? You've got to throw some little baits and catch them. And if you fertilize this pond, you're talking about 25 pounds per acre per year. You're talking about 75 to 125 small bass per acre per year. You're going to spend a lot of time fishing. That's why not, it's not right to fertilize all ponds. You may not have the chance to fish it that much. And if you don't, you're just going to force it into a stunted bass situation that much faster. All right, keep records. That's what we're trying to do. And we do it through selective harvest. Catch and release, if you go out on Lake Somerville or any of our public waters, absolutely, you should practice catch and release because of all those other predators out there that are competing with those bass and that you know the bass can't uh, necessarily bounce back that quick from. Private waters, if they're stocked right, catch and release is nothing but a kiss of death that leads to stunted populations. You've got to catch and keep or catch and remove. We don't need weeds, nothing wrong with some artificial reefs though, brush piles, things like that. Uh, some people like plants, I'm going to tell you how to kill them here in just a minute. But if you, want to, if you want a plant, how about a water lily and plant it in a barrel? Push it out there and let it go, you know, a foot or so under the water, make a nice six, eight foot diameter ring, some pretty uh, flowers, you can buy any color you want to now, they're hybridized so well. And so you can have a pink one or a peach one or a red one or whatever you want. And it, eventually it'll escape that barrel, but it'll be years. And they're not the hardest thing to control once they escape. So looking for fish reproduction. Get you a minnesane. 15 foot minnesane, academy, wally world, it don't matter. Put your significant other on the deep end. <laughs> See, I can say that she's not here. You don't go sane in the pond. This person stands still, that person goes out and comes back. Do that in three or four places in May, early June. And you should see these baby bass. That's what they look like. These are what we call young of the year. They've got these little stripes, got a big eye. That's what they look like. If you do that in three or four places in your pond and you don't see these guys in late May or whatever, something's wrong. Probably the something wrong is there's too many other bass that have already eaten them all. Same way you should see bluegill of various sizes. You know, from bluegill that were spawned last fall to bluegill that were spawned in March to bluegill that were just spawned last week because that's what they do. If you don't see bluegill of different sizes, something's wrong. Okay, other problems real fast. How am I doing on time? Am I done? No, I still got a little bit. Hmm? I'm fine. Uh, aquatic weeds are a big problem. Water quality, especially dissolved oxygen. I've talked about some of these other things already. Oxygen. This is what kills fish. I've been doing this, I'm not even going to say that. I've been doing this a while. <laughs> and probably 99% of every fish kill I've ever seen is due to low oxygen, due to a lack of enough oxygen for them to stay alive. This is what oxygen actually dissolves in water. Think of dissolving that sugar in tea earlier, right? But it's weird, it's kind of the opposite. In tea, you know, you dissolve more sugar if it's hot, less sugar if it's cold. With oxygen, exactly the opposite. Saturation is higher when it's cold water, lower when it's warm water. Look at this, how much wants to saturate or dissolve at 90 degree water temperatures? About seven parts per million. Million! Seven parts per million, is that a whole lot? I don't think so. This room is 
A percent is a part per hundred. The difference between a part per hundred and a part per million is about five decimal places. So that tells you oxygen doesn't dissolve very well in water and there's not much there to begin with. And if it gets down to below about three parts, that's when you fish, see fish up and skimming at the surface. We call it piping. It goes to two parts and sits there for several hours. Everything above about a half a pound dies. And if it goes below one part and sits there for several hours, even the little guys die. Rare that that last thing happens. This happens all the time. The big fish die. So what can you do? You got electricity to pond you. There's all kinds of electric aerators you can buy. And you can put them on timers because one of the things I didn't say is the demand for oxygen is highest at night because there's nothing producing it. There's no plant activity of photosynthesis like there is in the daytime. So when we're going to have most of our problems is when it's hot, warm, so summertime, and at night. So if you buy an electronic aerator like this, set it on a timer. Have it come on at 11 o'clock or midnight. Run till 6 or 7 in the morning. Let it shut off. You'll almost never have a fish kill if that's the case. Of course, we don't all have electricity. What else you got? You got a big pond, you got a tractor with a PTO, you can build a PTO-driven paddle wheel. But then you better be out there and looking at that pond early in the morning and see those fish up, or it won't do any good. Water pump, yeah, same sort of thing. If you see them up and you got a water pump, you put this intake in pretty shallow water. This needs to be about a foot or so of water because that's your best water. <laughs> And then you want to shoot it back across the pond so you create ripples and all that stuff. That will help. It won't save a big pond, but it might save fish in a small pond. This is one I really like. You got a bush hog? <laughs> Believe it or not, that'll work. The trouble is you run it for a few hours, you're going to have to replace the bearings in the bush hog, right? It's going to burn the bearings out in the bush hog. So you just got to ask yourself, which is more important, replacing those bearings or saving a few fish? All right. Here's the other thing, if you've got a deep pond, or a very large pond with some depth, then you may want one of these destratification aerators. This is a little, uh, usually it's a diaphragm or uh, type air pump, sits at the surface, goes down with weighted tubes down to something underneath the surface that's going to uh, bring up bubbles. And that's all it looks like at the surface, that's all you see. But this takes that deep water that we assume is cold, right? up to the surface and keeps the whole pond mixed. That cold, deep water is dead. There's usually zero oxygen in that by the, about the end of June. So believe it or not, that cold, deep water is no good to the fish. Yes, sir? It, it does, but the trouble is it's trapped under there. The cold water is trapped, so the oxygen becomes depleted from the bacteria and stuff that decompose things. So it, it should hold more oxygen, and it does in the wintertime, but the trouble is once it's isolated like that, above, I mean, below that warm layer, it becomes depleted even though it's cold because it has no interaction with the atmosphere anymore. Good point, though. Anyway, this will keep fish alive and, and actually make you a better pond, especially deep ponds, anything over about 12, 10 or 12 foot depth. Okay, vegetation. Are we surprised plants grow in ponds? What do plants need? Water, sunlight, and nutrients. What do ponds have? Water, sunlight, and nutrients. We create the perfect environment to grow plants. And then we're always surprised when we get them. Okay. The other thing about most aquatic plants is they have m amazing ways to repopulate or populate in the first place. Many of them produce seeds. Many of them can grow from a fragment of the mother plant. Many of them grow by sending out shoot, new plants from, shoot, from the roots. And some of them just put out baby plants, like your air plants. Think of that. Okay. So here's a good example. This is a native water lily called a spout, spatter dock or cow lily. Here's that root system. Now you tell me how we're going to spray enough herbicide on those half a dozen leaves to kill that. Not easy. That's why it takes multiple treatments in many cases to get these things under control. It's not easy. We have only a handful of, of herbicides we can use, and we're fighting a plant that's very, very well adapted to survive. 
These are the questions you should ask yourself. What am I treating? How am I going to control it? Any environmental consequences to that control? In the case of some herbicide, there's water use restrictions against livestock watering or against maybe uh, irrigation, which makes some sense. But, uh, but you've got to look at that. And finally, cost. And I can guarantee you all of these things are expensive. They are very expensive herbicides. First critical step, though, is identification. Here's the way we usually break it down. Algae, floating, submerged, emergent, and there's the definition. Again, the algae are very, very primitive plants. They don't have true root stems or leaves, although some of them look like they do. Uh, floating means the whole plant floats. I'm not talking about a water lily where the leaf floats. It's still rooted in the ground. That's not a floating plant. Th things like water hyacinth and duckweed, things like that. Submerged are mostly underwater, very flaccid stems, cooked spaghetti stuff, and then rigid stems on the emergent. So we get this kind of stuff about this time of the year. It'll start showing up. Pond scum, right? I had a girlfriend that called me that once. <laughs> You'd think I'd made her mad. <laughs> anyway, it's called filamentous because that's what you see. You see these little filaments in it. It's a type of algae that sometimes needs to be controlled. Here's a macroalgae, one that doesn't look like an algae. It looks like stems and leaves, but it's not true stems and leaves. And a common name, whoops, did it again. Common name of uh, Cara is skunk grass or skunkweed because it has a very foul odor. It's one of the few aquatic plants that have any kind of odor to them. But it kind of smells like garlic mixed with mud or something. Uh, so that's one quick and easy way. Here are some of your floating plants, your duckweed and your water meal. Smallest flowering plant in the known universe. Here's one that you really got to start watching for. This is giant salvinia. It's very much in East Texas and parts of uh, the coastal bend now. It's non-native. This is what it can do in about three months time. And then it starts building upon itself. I've seen layers of this where pine trees are growing on it because it's thick enough that it's supporting them. This is what all of these do. This is an electronic oxygen meter. Remember I said you need about three parts before fish are stressed? Can you read what that's saying? It's saying 0 0.14. That's 14 one hundredths of one part per million oxygen. There is nothing alive under that thing. That mat has basically shut off photosynthesis. It's shut off oxygen from the surface, and that body of water dies. And that's true of not only salvinia, it's true of duckweed, it's true of watermill, it's true of uh, water lettuce, and it's true of water hyacinth. There we go. And there's water hyacinth in ponds around here. I know there is. So never let it cover the surface. Fight it. This is a non-native plant that does a lot of damage. One of the things it does is it increases evaporation. These plants cool themselves by evaporating water from the leaves, and so they're pumping water from their roots up to their leaves and evaporating it, and actually increases evaporative loss by about two or three times. So we get into these drought years, these things are, are drying your pond up two or three times faster than if they weren't there. Submerged plants, these can be kind of confusing when you look at them. There's coontail, very, very common in this area. There's bushy pondweed, very, very, very common in this area, but you gotta figure out which one's which to know how to treat it. Uh, here's one of the things with submerged vegetation. We're looking at eight to 14 tons of vegetation per surface area if we're in four to six feet of water. Wow, don't you wish you could grow that much grass for your cattle, okay? Now we go out there with some herbicide and we kill it and it starts rotting, guess what happens? 14 tons of rotting vegetation takes the oxygen down to almost nothing and your fish die. Wasn't the chemical that killed the fish. If the chemical would have killed fish, it wouldn't have been legal. But the decomposition of all that vegetation brings the oxygen down and your fish die. Usually about three days after you treat it. Uh, cattails are an example of an emergent, of course. Most ponds get cattails. These are also uh, uh, emergent plants. The water lilies showed you some of those earlier. Sedges and rushes are emergent. And uh, water primrose is a very, very common emergent plant in this area. Think about it, it looks one way when it grows on the shore, looks 
fairly different when it grows out in the water. So you have to kind of make sure he's treating it on the shoreline too. Uh, and willows are bad. One thing bad about willows, not only are they poking holes in the dam if they're up on the dam, which isn't good, but again, this evaporation that they cause, this increased evaporation really makes you lose water in your ponds faster. So you need to control willows on your dam and you need to control them for evaporative loss. There's my website, Aquaplan. Anybody been on this? A few of y'all? Good. I created this because of water. I don't have time to tell that story. Never mind. It goes through the same thing, identification, plant, whether it's an algae, a uh, floating plant, an emerged plant, somewhere down further is uh, emergent. It goes through with pictures and drawings, simple descriptions. Always go to the other photographs. Because there's coontail, looks very different out of different waters sometimes, even though it's the same plant. So anyway, it helps you identify the plant once you say, yeah, that's what I got. Then you can go to the management option page. It talks about fertilization. It talks about dyes. Some people like to dye their pond. That helps. Uh, it talks about mechanical control devices. Finally, it talks about, uh, okay, I skipped a slide there. Okay, finally, it talks about herbicides. The registered herbicides gives them a grade of good to excellent. And all of these are hot buttons. So if you would to click on reward, it'll take you to the manufacturer, which in this case is Syngenta. One more click, and you're to the label. Again, the label is the law. The label tells you how to use it, when you should use it, when you should not use it, what the water use restrictions are, what the dangers are. Okay? So in the convenience of your home, you can read about these and and uh, determine if you want to use them, whether your children will be born naked after this or not. <laughs> they probably will be. They probably will be. Turtles, I don't know, that was on that thing. Turtles may be a nuisance, may be a reason to, uh, to, treat, uh, to uh, try to eliminate them or control them, but they are not harming your fish population. They are not harming your fish population, okay? The, well, it, again, there's one of those beautiful misconceptions. We're fishing, and we catch a fish, and we put it on a stringer, and we walk down the bank, and we come back, and what's happened? Three turtles are eating that son of a gun, right? Well, we held it down. It can't catch a healthy fish, but sure, it's an opportunist. It's going to eat it if we hold it down for it. It's a misconception. They're not hurting your population. There's enough fish out there to support what little the turtles catch. They don't catch many. This is the one turtle that actually catches fish pretty well, but it eats small fish, and that's one of the snapping turtles. This is the alligator snapper. The difference between an alligator snapper and a common snapper, common snapper only has one ridge. Alligator snapper has three ridges. The alligator snapper is protected. It's considered a threatened species in the state of Texas. Do not kill them. If you've got one and you're really aggravated at it, call Parks and Wildlife. I think they'll come relocate it. They, we don't want these animals killed. Birds. Uh, I've got to fix that slide. Um, a lot of people think wading birds are really harming them. They're not because they're in such shallow water. They're taking a lot of things other than fish, a lot of invertebrates. Uh, the few fish that they catch will be small fish. Again, it's not harming your population typically. The exception is this guy, and he doesn't wade. He dives. He's a swimmer, a cormorant, double-crested cormorant. These do hammer your fish populations if they come in in big flocks. They will always send a scout first. If you see one circling around and hanging around your pond, this is a federally protected species. You are not allowed to kill it without a permit, but you can harass it. <laughs> Just not to the point of death. You can shoot at it. You can scare it away. You keep it away from your pond, and he'll go to a neighbor's. He'll bring his family to the neighbor's pond. Okay? You can get a permit to kill them from Parks and Wildlife. Once you have the permit, it's good for two years. I think it's only like 15 bucks. Uh, if you think you're having a big problem with cormorants, then get the permit and kill them. Absolutely. But don't, don't do it without the permit. Again, the herons are, herons are wading birds. They're really not taking many fish. Yeah, the big herons are not doing enough damage to me. Right. No, I mean, they'll take a fish once in a while, sure. But they're not, 
taking the numbers of fish that would, should hurt your population. Uh, and again, herons are protected species, but you can harass them. Okay, you're allowed, to hara you're allowed to discourage those animals from coming to your ponds, but again, you're not allowed to kill them. Am I right on that, Jeff? Thank you. <laughs> got fish and wildlife back here, I gotta be careful what I say. <laughs> okay, that's it, I'm done. You can stick a fork in me. Uh, but I will be around to take questions. Do I have time for a question right now? No. I'm done. I told you I was done.